y, y prime and y double prime. Uh, so these are the, uh, sorry, q of uh, x times y equals zero. The linearity of the equation, that is the form in which it appears, uh, is going to be the key idea today. Uh, today is going to be theoretical, but some of the ideas in it are the most important in the course. Uh, so I don't have to apologize for the theory. <clears throat> Remember, the solution method was to find two independent y, one, two independent solutions, independent solutions. And now I'll formally write out what independent means. There are different ways to say it, but for you, I think the simplest and most intelligible will be to say that y2 is not to be a constant multiple of y1. And unfortunately, it's necessary to add, nor is y1 to be a constant multiple. I have to call it by a different constant, so let's call this one c prime uh, of y2. Well, I mean, the most obvious question is, well, look, if this is not a constant times that, this can't be there because I would just use 1 over c if it was. Uh, unfortunately, the reason I have to write it this way is to take account of the possibility that y1 might be 0. Uh, if y1 is 0, uh, see. So the bad case that must be excluded is that y1 equals 0, y2 non-zero. I don't want to call those independent. But nonetheless, it is true that y2 is not a constant multiple of c of y1. However, y1 is a constant multiple of y2, namely the multiple 0. It's just to exclude that case that I have to say both of those things, and one would not be suffice. Uh, that's a fine point, and I'm not going to fuss over it, uh, but I just have, of course. Um, <clears throat> now, why do you do that? Uh, that's because then all solutions, and this is what concerns us today, are what? A linear combination with constant coefficients of these two. And the fundamental question we have to answer today is why. Now, there are really two statements involved in that. Uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, I'm claiming there's an easier statement, which is that they are all solutions. So that's question one, or statement one. Why are all of these guys' solutions. That I could trust you to answer yourself. I could not trust you to answer it elegantly. And it's the elegance that's the most important thing today, because you have to answer it elegantly. Otherwise, you can't go on and do more complicated things. If you answer it in an ad hoc basis just by hacking out a computation, you don't really see what's going on and you can't do more difficult things later. So I have, we have to answer this and answer it nicely. The second question is, so the, the, that answers why they're solutions at all, but why are they all the solutions? Why all the solutions? In other words, to say it as badly as possible, why are all solutions and why are all, <laughs> never mind. Why, are, why all the solutions? This is a harder question to answer, but that should make you happy because that means it depends upon a theorem which I'm not going to prove. I'll just quote to you. <clears throat> Let's uh, attack, therefore, problem one first. Uh, Q1 is answered by what's called the superp superposition. And the superposition principle 
says exactly that. It says exactly that, that if y1 and y2 are solutions to a linear equation, to a linear homogeneous ODE, in fact, it can be of higher order, too, although I won't stress that. In other words, you could, don't have to stop with a second derivative. You could add a third derivative and a fourth derivative, as long as the form remained the same. <coughs> uh, then that implies automatically that C1y1 plus C2y2 is a solution. Now, the way to do that nicely is to take a little detour uh, and talk a little bit about linear operators. And I'm, since we're going to be using these for the rest of the term, uh, this is the natural place for you to learn a little bit about what they are. So I'm going to do it. Uh, Ultimately, I'm aimed at a proof of this statement, but there are going to be certain side excursions I have to make. Uh, the first thing uh, I side excursion is to write the dif differential equation in a different way. So I'm going to write its transformations. The first, I'll simply recopy it, what you know it to be. Qy equals 0. That's the first form. The second form, I'm going to replace this by the differentiation operator. So I'm going to write this as d squared y. That means differentiate it twice, d it and then d it again. Uh, this one, I only have to differentiate once. So I'll write that as p d y, p times the derivative of y. The last one isn't differentiated at all. I just recopy it. Now, I'm going to formally factor out the y. So this I'm going to turn into d squared plus pd plus q. Now, you, everybody reads this as times y equals 0. But what it means is this guy, it means this is shorthand for that. I'm not multiplying. I'm multiplying q times y but I'm not multiplying d times y. I'm applying d to y. Nonetheless, the notation suggests this. It's very suggestive of that. And this, in turn, implies that. That's what I, I'm just transforming it. And now I'll take the final step. I'm going to view the le this thing in parentheses as a guy all by itself, a linear operator. This is a linear operator called a linear operator. And I'm going to simply abbreviate it by the letter L. And so the final version of this equation, it's been reduced to nothing but Ly equals 0. Now, what's L? You can think of L as, uh, well, formally, L you would write as d squared plus pd plus q. But you can think of L, the way to think of it is as a black box. A function, what goes into this black box? Well, if this were a function box, what would go in would be a number, and what would come out would be a number. But it's not that kind of a black box. It's a, an operator box. And therefore, what goes in is a function of x. And what comes out is another function of x. The result of applying this operator to that. So from this point of view, uh, differential equations, uh, Trying to solve the differential equation means you want what should come out. You want to come out 0. And the question is, what should you put in? That's what means solving differential equations in an inverse problem. The easy thing is to put in a function and see what comes out. You just calculate. The hard thing is to ask, you say, I want such and such a thing to come out. For example, 0, uh, what should I put in? That's a difficult question. And that's what we're spending the term answering. Now, the key thing about this is that this is a linear operator. And what that means is that it has certain, behaves in a certain way with respect to functions. The easiest way to say it is, I, I like to make two laws of it. That L of u1, if you have two functions, I'm not going to put in the parentheses x, because that you know, just makes things look longer and not any clearer, actually. 
What does L do to the sum of two functions? If it's a linear operator, it must, if you put in the sum of two functions, what you must get out is the corresponding L's, the sum of the corresponding L's of each. So that's a law. And the other law, linearity law, and this goes for anything in mathematics and its applications, which is called linear. Basically, anything is linear if it does the following thing to functions or numbers or whatever. Uh, L, the other one, is of a constant times any function, I don't have to give it a number now because I'm only using one of them, should be equal to C times L of U. So here C is a constant, and here, of course, the U is a function, functions of x. These are the two laws of linearity. An operator is linear if it satisfies these two laws. Now, for example, the differentiation operator is such an operator. Is D is linear. Why? Well, because of the very first things you verify when you, after you learn what the derivative is, because the derivative of well, I won't write it in the D form. I'll write it in the form in which you know it. It would be D applied to U1 plus U2. How does one write that in ordinary calculus? Well, like that. Or maybe you write D by DX out front. Let's write it this way. Is equal to U1 prime plus U2 prime. That's a law. You prove it when you uh, first study what a derivative is. It's a property. Of, from our point of view, it's a property of the differentiation operator. It has this property. The d of u1 plus u2 is d of u1 plus du2. And it also has the property that cu prime, you can pull out the constant. It does not affect it by the differentiation. So these two familiar laws from the beginning of calculus say in our language that d is a linear operator. What about the multiplication law? There's, that's even more important, that u1 times u2 prime. I have nothing whatever to say about that here. In this context, that's, it's an important law, but it's not important with respect to the linear, this study of linearity. So there's an example. Here's a more complicated one that I'm claiming as a linear operator. And since I don't want to have to work in this lecture, the work is left to you. So the proof prove that L is uh, linear is this particular operator, L is linear. That's in your part one homework. To verify that. And you'll do some simple exercises in uh, recitation tomorrow to sort of warm you up for that if you haven't done it already. Well, you shouldn't have because it it's only goes with this lecture, actually. <coughs> it's forbidden to work ahead in this class. All right, where are we? Uh, well, all that was a prelude to proving this simple theorem, the superposition principle. So finally, what's the proof? Well, the proof of the superposition principle, if you believe if you believe that the operator is linear, then L of C1, <clears throat> in other words, the ODE is the ODE is L. L is d squared plus PD plus Q. Uh, so the ODE is LY equals 0. And what am I being asked to prove? I'm being asked to prove that if y1 and y2 are solutions, then so is that thing. By the way, that's called a linear combination. Put that in your notes. Maybe I better write it even on the board, because it's something people say all the time without realizing they haven't defined it. This is called a linear combination. A linear, this expression is called a linear combination of y1 and y2. It means that particular sum with constant coefficients. OK, so the ODE is Ly equals 0, and I'm trying, to prove, I'm trying to prove that fact about it, that if y1 and y2 are solutions, so is a linear combination of them. So the proof, then, 
I start with apply L2 C1 Y1 plus C2 Y2. Now, because this operator is linear, it takes the sum of two functions into the corresponding sum of what the operator would be. So it would be L of C1 Y1 plus L of C2 Y2. C Y2. That's because L is a linear operator. But I don't have, have to stop there. Because L is a linear operator, I can pull the C out front. So it's C1 L of Y1 plus C2 L of Y2. Now where am I? I'm trying to prove that this is 0. Well, what is L of Y1? At this point, I use the fact that Y1 is a solution. Because it's a solution, this is 0. That's what it means to solve a, that differential equation. It means when you apply the linear operator L to the function, you get 0. In the same way, this is y2 is a solution, so that's 0. And the sum of 0, c1 times 0 plus c2 times 0 is 0. That's the argument. Now, you could make the same argument just by plugging c1 y1 plus plugging it into the equation and calculating and calculating and calculating, grouping the terms and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's just calculation. It doesn't show you why it's so. Why it's so is because the operator, this differential equation, is expressed as a linear operator applied to y is 0. And the only properties that are really being used is the fact that this operator is linear. That's the key point. L is linear. The linear operator. <clears throat> well, that's all there is to the superposition principle. Uh, as a prelude to s answering the more difficult question, why are these all the solutions? Why are there no other solutions? Uh, we need a few definitions and a few more ideas. And they are going to occur in connection with, so I'm now addressing ultimately question two, but it's not going to be addressed directly for quite a while. Uh, instead, I'm going to phrase it in terms of solving the initial value problem. So far, we've only talked about the general solution with this arbitrary con those two arbitrary constants. But how do you solve the initial value problem? In other words, fit initial conditions. Find the solution uh, with given initial values for the function and its derivatives. Now, <clears throat> the theorem is that this collection of functions with these arbitrary constants These are all the solutions we have so far. In fact, they are all the solutions there are, but we don't know that yet. However, if we just focus on this big class of solutions, there might be others lurking out there somewhere, lurking down there. I don't know. Uh, but let's use what we have, that just from this family, we can, you can, uh, is enough to satisfy any initial condition to satisfy any initial values. In other words, if you give me any initial values, I will be able to find the C1 and C2 which work. Now, why is that? Well, I wouldn't, I'd have to do a song and dance if, but I, at this point, if you hadn't been softened up by actually calculating for specific differential equations, you've had exercises in actually how to calculate the values of C1 and C2. So I'm going to do it now in general, what you've done so far for particular equations using particular values of the initial conditions. So I'm relying on that experience that you've had in doing the homework to, to uh, soften, to, to make intelligible what I'm going to do now in the abstract using just letters. So why is this so? Why is that so? Well, we're going to need a by the way here, too. I'll have to, again, open up a parentheses. But let's go as far as we can. 
Well, you just try to do it. Uh, suppose the initial conditions are, uh, how will we write them? Let's, uh, so they're going to be at some initial point x0. I, you can take it to be 0 if you want, but I'd like to be just for a little while a little more general. So let's say the initial condition, the initial values are being given at the point x0. All right, that's going to be some number, uh, let's just call it a. And I also specify, the initial value also has to specify the velocity or the uh, value of the derivative there. Let's say these are the initial values. So the problem is to find the c which work. Now, how do you do that? Well, you know from calculation. You write y equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2. And you write y prime. Then you take the derivative underneath that, which is easy to do. And now you plug in the plug in x equals x0. And what happens? Well, these now turn into a set of equations. What will they look like? Well, y of x0 is a, and this is b. So what I get is c, uh, let me flop it over onto the other side, because that's the way you're lose, used to looking at systems of equations. What we get is c1 times y1 of x0 plus c2 times y2 of x0. What's that supposed to be equal to? Well, that's supposed to be equal to y of x0. It's supposed to be equal to the no given number a. And in the same way, c1 y1 prime of x0 plus c2 y2 prime of x0, that's supposed to turn out to be the number b. In the calculations you've done up to this point, y1 and y2 were always specific functions, like e to the x or cosine of 22x, stuff like that. Now I'm doing it in the abstract, just calling them y1 and y2, so as to include all those possible cases. Now what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to find c1 and c2. What kind of things are they? This is what you studied in high school, right? The letters are horrendous, but it's a pair of simultaneous linear equations. What are the variables? What are the variables? What are the variables? Somebody raise his hand who thinks. <laughs> if you have a pair of simultaneous linear equations, you've got variables and you've got constants, right? And you're trying to find the answer. What are the variables? Yeah. C1, C1. C1 and C2. I mean, it's extremely confusing because in the first place, how can they be the variables if they occur on the wrong side? They're on the wrong side. They're constants. How can constants be variables? Everything about this is wrong. Nonetheless, the C1 and the C2 are the unknowns, if you like the high school terminology. C1 and C2 are the unknowns. These messes are just numbers. After you plugged in x0, this is some number. Number, you got four numbers here. So c1 and c2 are the variables. The to find, in other words, to find the values of. All right, now you know a general theorems from 1802 about when can you solve such a system of equations. I'm claiming that you can always find c1 and c2 that work. But you know that it's not always the case that a pair of simultaneous linear equations can be solved. There's a condition which there's a condition which guarantees their solution, which is what? What has to be true about the coefficients? These are the coefficients. What has to be true? The matrix of coefficients must be invertible. The determinant of coefficients must be non-zero. So they're solvable if for the C1 and C2, if this thing, why I'm going to write it, since I'm going to all of these are evaluated at x0, I'm going to write it in this way. Y1, the determinant whose entries are y1, y2, y1 prime, and y2 prime, evaluated at 0, x0. That means I evaluate <coughs> each of the functions in the determinant at x0. I'll write it this way. That should be not 
zero. So in other words, the key thing which makes this possible, makes it possible for us to solve the initial value problem, is that this funny determinant should not be zero at the point at which we're interested. Now, you know, this determinant is important in 1803. It has a name, and this is when you're going to learn it if you don't know it already. That determinant is called the Ronskian. The Ronskian of what? Uh, if you want to be pompous, you say this with a V sound instead of a W, but nobody does except people trying to be pompous. Uh, the Ronskian, uh, we'll write it W. Now notice. You can only calculate it when you know what the two functions are. So the Ronskian of the two functions, y1 and y2, what's the variable? It's not a function of two variables, y1 and y2. These are just the names of functions of x. So when you do it, put it in, calculate out that determinant, this is a function of x, a function of the independent variable after you've done the calculation. Anyway, let's write its definition, y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. <clears throat> now, in order to do this, the point is we must know that that Ronskian is not zero at, the Ronskian of these two functions is not zero at the point x zero. Now, Enter a theorem, which again, you're going to prove for homework. Uh, but this is harder, so it's part two homework. It's not part one homework. In other words, I didn't give you the answer. You got to find it yourself. Uh, alone or in the company of good friends. Uh, so anyway, here's the Ronsky. And now, it's, let's, what can you say, what can we say for sure if, note, Suppose y1 and y, just to get you fe a, a feeling for a little bit, suppose they were not independent. The word for not independent is dependent. Suppose they were dependent. In other words, suppose that y2 were a constant multiple of y1. We know that's not the case, because our functions are supposed to be independent. But suppose they weren't. What would the value of the Ronskian be? If y2 is a constant times y1, then y2 prime is that same constant times y1 prime. What's the value of the determinant? Zero. For what values of x is it zero? For all values of x. And now that's the theorem that you're going to prove. That if y1 and y2 are solutions, to the ODE, I won't keep, say, it's the ODE we've been talking about, y double prime plus py plus the linear ODE, homogeneous, constant, with a, uh, not constant coefficient, just linear, homogeneous, second order. Our solutions, there are only two possibilities, either, either or. Either the Ronskian of y, there are only two possibilities. Either the Ronskian of y1 and y2 is always 0, identically 0. 0 for all values of x. This is redundant. When I say identically, I mean for all values of x, but I'm just making assurance doubly sure. OK. Or the Ronskian is never 0. Now, there is no notation for that. I better just write it out. Is, not, is never 0, i.e., for no x. Is it, <laughs> i.e., for all x? It's not, <laughs> there's no way to say this. I mean, for all values of x, it's not 0. <laughs> that means not, there is not a single point for which it's 0. In particular, it's not 0 here. So this is your homework, problem 5, part 2. I give you a method of proving it, which is um, 
which was discovered by the famous Norwegian mathematician Abel, uh, who uh, is, I guess, his, the centenary of his birth, or de birth, I guess, was just celebrated last year. Um, he has one of the truly tragic stories in mathematics, and which I think you can read. It must be in Simmons' book, if you have that. Simmons is very good on biographies. Now look up Abel. He'll have a biography of Abel, and you can weep if you're feeling sad. He died at the age of 26 of tuberculosis, having done a number of sensational things, uh, none of which was recognized in his lifetime because people buried his papers under big piles of papers and, uh, you know. So he died unknown, uncelebrated, and now he's Norwegian's greatest culture, Norway's greatest culture hero. In the middle of a park in Oslo, there's a huge statue, and since nobody knew what, uh, nobody knows what Abel looked like, it's the statue is way up high, so you can't see very well, but, <laughs> but, but the inscription on the bottom says Niels Henrik Abel, uh, such and such, 1801 to 1826 or something like that. Um, Now, <clears throat> the choice, I'm still, believe it or not, aiming at question two, uh, but I have another big parentheses to open, and when I've closed it, the answer to question two will be simple. Uh, but I think it's very desirable that you get this second big parenthesis. Uh, it'll help you to understand something important. It'll help you to, on your problem set uh, tomorrow night. And uh, I, don't have to <laughs> I don't have to apologize. I'm just going to do it. So the question is, the thing you have to learn, you have to understand is that when I write this combination, these are, I'm claiming that these are all the solutions. I haven't proved that yet, but uh, this is, they're going to be all the solutions. The point is there's nothing sacrosanct about the y1 and y2. This is exactly the same collection as a collection which I would write using other constants. Let's call it u1 and u2. They're exactly the same where u1 and u2 are any other pair of linearly independent solutions, any other pair of independent solutions. They must be independent, neither a constant multiple of the other. And uh, in other words, u1 is some combination. Now I'm really stuck because I don't know how to uh, C1 bar, let's say. That means a special value of C1 and a special value of C2. And U2 is some other special value. Oh, my God. C1 double bar. How is that? I'm, the notation is getting worse and worse, and I apologize for it. In other words, I don't, I could pick Y1 and Y2 and make up all of these, and I'd get a bunch of solutions, but I could also pick some other family, some other two guys in this family, and just as well express the solutions in terms of u1 and u2. Now, well, why is he telling us that? Well, I, the point is that y1 and the y2 are typically the ones you get easily from solving the equations, like e to the x and e to the 2x. That's what you've gotten, or cosine x and sine x, something like that. But for certain ways, they might not be the best way of writing the solutions. There's another way of writing them, which you should learn, and that's called finding normalized, the normalized. You, they're OK, but they're not normalized. For some things, the normalized solutions are the best. I'll explain to you what they are, and I'll explain to you what they're good for. Uh, you'll see immediately what they're good for. The no normalized solutions, uh, 
Now, you have to specify the point at which you're normalizing. In general, it would be x naught, but let's say, let's at this point, since uh, I don't have an infinity of time, let's, to simplify things, let's say 0. It could be x naught. Any point would do just as well, but 0 is the most common choice. What are the normalized solutions? Well, first of all, I have to give them names. Uh, I, I want to still call them y, so I'll call them capital Y. 1 and y2. And what they are are the solutions which satisfy certain special, very special initial conditions. And what are those? So the y ones, the, they satisfy, they're the ones which satisfy. This is the, the initial conditions for y1 are, of course, they're going to be guys that look like this. The only thing that's going to make them distinctive is the initial conditions they satisfy. All right, y1 has to satisfy at 0, its value should be 1, and the value of its derivative should be 0. For y2, it's just the opposite. Here, the value of the function should be 0 at 0, but the value of its derivative now I want to be 1. Let me give you a trivial example of this, and then one which is a little less trivial, so you'll have some feeling for what I'm asking for. Suppose the equation, for example, is y double prime plus, uh, well, let's really make it simple. OK. You know the standard solutions are y1 is cosine x, and y2 is sine x. These are functions which, when you take the second derivative, they turn into their negative. You know, you could go with the complex roots or i and minus i and blah, 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 blah. If you do it that way, fine. But at some point in the course, you have to be able to write down them right away. Oh, yeah, cosine x, sine x. OK. What are the normalized things? Well, what's the value of this at 0? It is 1. What's the value of its derivative at 0? 0. This is y1. This is the only case in which you lock on immediately to the normalized solutions. In the same way, this guy is y2, because its value at 0 is 0. Its value of its derivative at 0 is 1. So this is y2. OK, now let's look at a case where you don't immediately lock on to the normalized solutions. Very simple. All I have to do is change the sign. Here, you know, think through. r squared minus 1 the, equals 0. The characteristic roots are plus 1 and minus 1, right? And therefore, the solution is e to the x and e to the negative x. So the solutions you find by the usual way of solving it is y1 equals e to the x and y2 equals e to the negative x. Those are the Standard solution, so the general solution is of the form, so the general solution is of the form c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the negative x. Now, what I want to find out is what is y1 and y2? How do I find out what y1 is? Well, I have to satisfy initial conditions. So if this is y, let's write down here, if you can still see that, y prime is c1 e to the x minus c2 e to the negative x. So if I plug in, I want y of 0 to be 1. I want this guy at the point 0 to be 1. What equation does that give me? That gives me c1 plus c2, c1 plus c2, plugging in x equals 0, equals the value of this thing at 0, so that's supposed to be 1. How about the other guy? The value of its derivative is supposed to come out to be 0. And what is its derivative? Well, plug into this expression. It's c1 minus c2. OK, what's the solution to those pair of equations? c2 has to be equal to c1. The sum of the two of them has to be 1. Each one, therefore, is equal to 1 half. And so what's the value of y1? y1, therefore, is the function where c1 and c2 are 1 half. 
It's the function e to the x plus e to the negative x divided by 2. In the same way, I won't repeat the calculation. You can do it yourself. The same calculation shows that y2, so put in the initial conditions, the answer will be that y2 is equal to e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by 2. These are the special functions. For this equation, these are the normalized solutions. They're better than the original solutions uh, because their initial values are nicer. Just check it. The initial value, when x is equal to 0, the initial value, this has the value 1, and the value of its derivative is 0. Here, when x is equal to 0, the value of the function is 0, but the value of its derivative, these cancel, is 1. So these are the good guys. OK, something, there's no colored chalk this period. OK, that, they were colored chalk. There's one. So for this equation, these are the good guys. These are our best solutions. e to the x and e to the minus x are good solutions, but these are our better solutions. Uh, and this one, of course, is the function which is called hyperbolic sine of x, and this is the one which is called the hyperbolic cosine of x. This is one of the most important ways in which they enter into mathematics, and this is why the engineers want them. Now, why do the engineers want normalized solutions? Well, I didn't explain that. So what's so good about normalized solutions? Very simple. If y1 and y2 are normalized at 0, let's say, then the solution to the initial to the IVP, in other words, the ODE, plus the initial values, y of 0 equals, let's say, a, and y prime of 0 equals b. So the ODE, I'm not repeating. It's the one we've been talking about all term, uh, since the beginning of the period. It's the one with the p of x and q of x. Uh, and here are the initial values. I'm going to call them a and b. Or you can also call them, uh, if you like, y. Maybe that's better to call them y0, as they are in the visual and the homework. They're called, uh, I'm using the, oh, let's use those. What is the solution? I say the solution is, if you use y1 and y2, the solution is y0, in other words, the a, times y1, plus y0 prime, in other words, b, times y2. In other words, you can write down instantly the solution to the initial value problem instead of, if instead of using the functions you started out with, the little y1 and y2, you use these better functions. The thing that's better about them is that they instantly solve for you the initial value problem. All you do is use this number, initial condition, as the coefficient of y1, and use this number as the coefficient of y2. Now, just check that by looking at it. Why is that so? Well, for example, let's check. What is its value of this function at 0? Well, the value of this guy at 0 is 1. So the answer is y0 times 1. And the value of this guy at 0 is 0. So this term disappears. And it's exactly the same with the derivative. What's the value of the derivative at 0? It is. The value of the derivative of this thing is 0, so this term disappears. The value of this derivative at 0 is 1, and so the answer is y0 prime. So you check, check, this works. So these better solutions have the property, what's good about them and why scientists and engineers like them is that they enable you immediately to write down the answer to the initial value problem without having to go through this business, which I buried down here, of solving simultaneous linear equations. OK, now, believe it or not, that's all the work. Uh, we're ready to answer question number two, why are these all the solutions? Of course, I have to invoke a big theorem. Uh, big theorem, where shall I invoke a big theorem? 
Um, All right, let's see if we can do it here. <laughs> the big theorem says, it's called the existence and uniqueness theorem. It's the last thing that's proved at the end of an analysis course, uh, at which real analysis course over which students sweat for one whole semester. And their reward at the end is if they're very lucky and have been very good students, they get to see the proof of the existence and uniqueness theorem for differential equations. But I can at least say what it is for the linear equation because it's so simple. It says, so the equation we're talking about is the usual one. Homogeneous equation. And I'm going to assume, you have to have assumptions, that P and Q are continuous, continuous for all x. So they're good looking functions. Coefficients aren't allowed to blow up anyway. They've got to look nice. Then. The theorem says the, there is one and only one solution, one and only uh, one solution satisfying given initial values such that y of 0, let's say y of 0, is equal to some given number a and y uh, let's make it y zero. A, 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 A. And y prime of zero equals B. The initial value problem has one and only one solution. The existence is it has a solution. The uniqueness is it only has one solution. If you specify the initial conditions, there's only one function which satisfies them and at the same time satisfies that differential equation. Now, this answers our question. This answers our question. Because look, what I want is all solutions. What we want are all solutions to the ODE. And now, here's what I say. I claim that this collection of functions, C1, Y1, plus C2, Y2, are all solutions. Of course, I began the period by show, saying I'd show you that C1 little Y1, C little Y2 are all the solutions. But it's the case that these two families are the same. So the family that I started with would be exactly the same as the family C1 prime Y1, because after all, these are two special guys from that collection. So it doesn't matter whether I talk about the original ones or these. The theorem is still the same. Now, the final step, therefore, if you give me one more minute, I think that will be quite enough. Why is the, why are these all the solutions? Well, I have to take an arbitrary solution and show you that it's one of these. So the proof is, given a solution, ux, what are its values? It's a, well, u of x0 is u0, and u prime of x0 0, let's say, is equal to u0, is equal to some other number. Now, what's the solution? Write down, what is the solution which of these using the y1s? Then I know I've just shown you that u0 times y1 plus u0 prime y2 satisfies the same initial conditions, satisfies these initial conditions, initial values. In other words, I started with my little solution. U of x walks up to it and says, hi there, hi there. And the differential equation looks at it and says, uh, who are you? And he said, oh, I satisfy, I satisfy you and uh, my initial. And then it says, it says, what are your initial values? It said, my initial values are u0 and u0 prime. 
and it said, sorry, but we got one of ours who satisfies the same initial conditions. We don't need you because the existence and uniqueness theorem says that there can only be one function which does that, and therefore you must be equal to this guy. by the uniqueness theorem. OK, we'll talk more about stuff next time, linear equations next time. <laughs>